Rebonjour mesdames et messieurs, je suis Manel Bonossi, j'aurai le grand plaisir de vous accompagner cet après-midi. Si vous voulez de nous rejoindre après le déjeuner, bienvenue à vous, à cette neuvième édition du rendez-vous de Casablanca de l'assurance, placé sous le haut patronage de sa majesté le roi, que Dieu l'assiste. Marhaben bidouyou final kiram. And welcome, special welcome to our international guests, if you just joined us this afternoon. Quelle belle matinée nous avons vécu aujourd'hui. Superbe matinée avec des interventions de haut niveau de la part de, de nos représentants, du ministère des Finances, du régulateur, de la FMSR, de notre pays hôte, le Nigeria. Et je ne sais pas vous, mais j'ai été particulièrement impressionné par le petit échange qu'a eu M. Béchir Beddo avec euh, Souad Moukhtadiri. D'autres personnes ont apprécié euh, le petit échange matinal. Euh, beaucoup de technologies euh, déployées lors de cet événement. D'ailleurs, j'en profite pour vous rappeler qu'il y a deux QR codes qui apparaissent à l'écran. Un premier qui vous permettra de télécharger le programme et un deuxième qui utilise l'intelligence artificielle. On vous demandera de prendre un selfie et ce logiciel automatiquement ira chercher dans la galerie des photos qui ont été prises ce matin, les photos qui vous concernent. Donc, euh, un petit logiciel bien sympathique, n'hésitez pas à l'utiliser. Il suffit de sortir votre téléphone, de zoomer sur le QR code qui est sur la droite, et vous pourrez récupérer les photos qui vous concernent. Bien, donc cet après-midi, nous poursuivons avec un programme tout aussi intéressant, euh, des intervenants de très haut niveau. Et donc, pour commencer, on va démarrer par une keynote sur les défis posés par les progrès technologiques. Puis deux panels suivront. Le premier sur le digital au service de l'assurance automobile et le deuxième sur les initiatives de sécurité routière. Ensuite, nous avons prévu du temps pour vous, mesdames et messieurs, pour que vous puissiez vous retrouver. Je sais que les échanges sont appréciés, que c'est des occasions d'échanger, de networker. Donc, on a prévu une après-midi plus courte pour que vous puissiez vous retrouver et poursuivre vos échanges. Donc, euh, étant donné que certains de nos invités sont anglophones, je voudrais m'assurer que tout le monde est équipé euh, des casques d'interprétation de, euh, simultanée. Cet après-midi se passera vraiment en alternance euh, également entre le français et, et l'anglais. So, uh, now, without further ado, um, I would like to welcome on stage to kick off this afternoon, Mr. James Kent, Global CEO of Calagari, for his keynote speech. Please give him a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Malin, for that introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, um, particularly in Casablanca, at the Casablanca Rendezvous. Uh, I was last here four years ago, and for me and my colleagues from Gallagheria, it's so important to be here in the region, uh, not only because this is such a key hub for the Middle East and Africa region, um, but also for all of the clients and markets here uh, for our opportunity to support you. So thank you for the opportunity to be the keynote speaker, and. Um, we do actually have some slides here. Hopefully you can see them at the back there. And as you can see, the, 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 the talk today is all about the future of transportation and the opportunities and challenges that that presents the insurance and reinsurance market. The future of transportation will largely be determined by changing behaviors, changing vehicles, adoption of cutting ed edge technology, pricing, and the introduction of new risk partners. The auto class of business has experienced more pressure to change in the last five years than it has in the previous 50. And that desire for change is only likely to increase 
looking at this picture up here of this car, that looks like the car of the future than the cars of 10 or 15 years ago. As an industry, we have a wonderful opportunity to drive this change and affect change, um, but we also need to react, and, and the presentation today will talk about that. But if you, if you don't mind, I will start off actually with a general state of the market. And, you know, as I say, we're here to talk about the Africa and Middle East market, but you are part of a global reinsurance market where there are perhaps less than 100 companies that write reinsurance around the world. And so it's a very concentrated market. And some of the uh, dynamics that are impacting our reinsurance market today will, of course, feed into this region. And the way that we see the market today, there's really five drivers that are, that are impacting the industry in, in quite a major way. One is climate change. The second is the geopolitical environment, which feels more tense than perhaps any time in the last 70 or 80 years. Inflation is at an all-time high for many countries, for the, when I say an all-time high, an all-time high for the last two decades. Uh, the asset side of the balance sheet is challenged with both equities and the bond market. And then finally, if you look at the losses that have challenged the, the insurance and reinsurance market, two of them can really be described as black swan events. They weren't modeled, they weren't seen. Um, when we went into lockdown in March 2019, um, I don't think anyone foresaw the impact that that would have across so many different lines of business and so many regions. You know, it's a worldwide event that really impacted the entire insurance industry. And, and you wind the clock forward to a year ago where Russia in, in, invaded Ukraine, and we have a loss there or an event there that is impacting so many different lines of business. And the loss there yet remains unknown. So we're in this awfully challenging time for the industry. And what that means is, is that the reinsurance market that we're in today is one that I have never worked in in my 35-year career. And that is an industry where every region and every product line, including motor, is being pushed upwards by the reinsurance market. It is being pushed up, up in attachment point because reinsurers want to move away from the frequency of loss, and it has been pushed up in pricing. And it's never happened before in my career. We've had incidences where... Uh, we have um, certain areas, whether it's defined by U.S. hurricane or German floods or liability losses that imp impact those particular lines. But I haven't been in an industry where everything move moves up at the same time. But I will say this, it's not a true hard market. By our definition, a true hard market is where you cannot place business. There is no capacity irrespective of price. That is not the market that we, were we are in today. Um, but we are in a market where certainly, um, you know, uh, finding price discovery and finding capital is, is, is very difficult. But moving back to motor, I'm going to talk about the technological developments within the market and then the challenges and opportunities that we face as an industry. So just, oops, sorry. Just here is a timeline of the motor insurance industry, and this will be known to many of you, but I think the point that we're talking about is really what's happened in the last five years. But motor insurance, from a UK perspective, using that as an example, has been around for over 100 years. By the 1930s, the UK legislated a compulsory car insurance scheme through something called the Road Traffic Act, and this required all vehicle owners to be insured for the liability for injury or death to third parties while their vehicles were being used on public roads. Germany followed with similar laws nine years later. In the 1980s and 90s, the UK motor insurance saw new technological pro progress through direct line model and online direct consumer. And that was using the telephone to significantly cut costs and provide online platforms direct to the consumer. Now in 2023, we see that the auto insurance industry has become a highly commoditized product that is widely available from an enormous array of providers with cover ranging from basic third party to comprehensive for all types of vehicles and for all types of uses. Given that the nature of these risks are well understood, this allows the consumer to largely base their decision on price. On this slide here, this is, this, this is, this is uh, where is this capital coming on? Where is this technology coming from? And if we step back to 2012, that is seen as the period when the InsureTech revolution started. And what is, what is InsureTech? Essentially, that is technology companies looking to enter the insurance space. 
whether as providers of software, providers of consulting services, or actually taking risk themselves. And you can see through this graph just the, the, the step up, how the funding has increased over the last decade. Um, it's roughly, it's somewhere between 50 and 70 deals over the last five years. And that in the aggregate totals about seven and a half billion dollars of funding that has come into what we call the motor insuretech area. That represents about 15% of all funding for insuretech worldwide. So you can see how influential the motor business has been in terms of funding from the insuretech market. And just in terms of some highlights here, these are some key um, developments that have happened over, over that period. Um, there's a few that I'd draw your attention to. Um, at the top right there, um, the most recent large raise has been by a South Korean insurtech company called Carrot, who raised $145 million. The only other one that is of that scale of $100 million or plus was done by a Chicago-based uh, organization called Clearcover, who, through a number of different raises, have raised $430 million, which values their business at $1.5 billion. So clearly there's no shortage of activity and interest in this class of business as far as investors are concerned. Despite the volume of investment, it would be fair to say that the promise of universal technology adoption has been limited to pockets of the globe, and incumbent insurers still dominate the motor market. That's true in developed countries, and that's true in the less developed countries. One deal that is worth uh, noting is that everyone said, would Amazon get into the insurance game? Well, you can see that in, in, in Q4 uh, 2021, um, Amazon uh, committed $225 million into an Indian-based uh, insurtech company called Akko. Um, this is where Amazon used its marketplace in India as a distribution platform to sell auto products to Amazon users. And then finally, it's not, it's not all good news. If I go to the 2016 funding there at the bottom, that's a company called Metromile. And Metromile was a company that was going to be the motor insurtech company, attracted a lot of attention. But despite this promise, Metromile, dis, uh, it really struggled to capitalize on their technology advantage. And a year ago, they were purchased by Lemonade. Since then, Lemonade, which is also an insurtech company, has sold off the technology and the company no longer exists. And I think that's reflective of many, many areas of the insurtech industry. In fact, we see a failure rate of about 98% of companies that set themselves up. So, so while the technology is absolutely critical, sorry, it keeps bouncing here. Um, but while the technology is critical, um, it by no means is the answer for everything. So with this, with this funding coming in, what are the technological developments that we're seeing? and what ones are being deployed in our industry. And we're focused on four key developments here, technology for the vehicle, third party technology and data, changing user habits, and the vehicles of the future. So starting with technology for the vehicle, I'm sure you've all heard of telematics, and that now is, 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 is installed in many uh, cars. And in fact, many, many new uh, modern vehicles actually have embedded hardware in the vehicle when you buy them. And that allows insurers to collect data about driver behavior and vehicle performance. This allows the insurer to reward all policyholders with lower premiums if they are prepared to reduce, the driver is prepared to reduce risk by adjusting behavior behind the wheel. For the higher risk drivers, this could be the difference between getting insurance cover coverage or not at all. Several companies have deployed usage-based insurance to underwrite and improve upon traditional pricing factors to match real-time insights they have learned. This includes visual data from dash cams, often with integrated telematics, and adds another level to the data available to the in insurer, particularly at the point of claim. For third-party data, we have sensors creating proprietary information and available third-party data are also playing a key role in road safety and driver awareness. The better use of data and use of mitigating sensors, either on the vehicle itself or in a smartphone, can detect accidents within moments of them occurring and can send immediate critical details such as location, driver identification and time. Sensors can also monitor the drivers themselves, recording such aspects as level of distraction, fatigue and non-verbal indicators. 
This helps warn drivers earlier and could limit the number of accidents caused by driver error and prevent claims on insurance and, of course, increase safety for all of us. In terms of changing habits, most, for most customers, the standard auto insurance product is a good fit. However, for some niches, there are opportunities for new products. This is, this is really well exemplified by the sharing economy and the mobility as a service with Uber and Lyft and many other ride services where the car use is consumed as a service. This is growing in many towns and cities around the world and insurers are now developing the auto insurance ecosystems using the available technology to be able to under, better underwrite those risks. And then finally, the vehicles of the future. Um, we've all heard of electric cars and then you have fully autonomous cars. And these have somewhat dominated telematics in the debate concerning the future of auto insurance. There is a good reason as the development of these driverless cars is being undertaken by companies that do not have a transport market pedigree, Google being one very obvious example, but that see the opportunities of the sharing economy. As autonomous vehicles enter the market, coverage may shift from the individual to the corporates themselves, seeking liability coverage or to individual policies for each individual vehicle. So for the insurers in the room, what are the key challenges you're facing? But equally, what are the key opportunities? And here you can see we've focused on five, emerge, um, five challenges, but equal opportunities. And, and those in order are cyber perils, technology enhancements that is leading to higher claim severity, the giggle sharing economy, electric vehicles, and autonomous vehicles. So starting with emerging cyber, you know, we spoke, I spoke about the fact that many cars have, have these telematics and, and, and data access within the vehicles themselves. And many, many, many cars these days are now equipped with internet connectivity. And obviously that leads to cyber exposure. So one of the things that, that we, we don't believe that the industry has got a grapple of is what is that exposure to cyber and how is it managing that risk? Uh, at the same time, one of our fastest growing lines of business beyond, the, beyond motor is actually the cyber insurance itself. And there is an awful lot of expertise coming out of the industry and coming into the industry um, and generating a better understand of cyber risk. So one of the opportunities we see is the motor industry and the cyber industry in partnership together to better understand, quantify and mitigate these, these potential exposures. The second one was the, um, the trend on technology, uh, technology developments that lead to severity, severity increases. Um, about five years ago, I, um, I was in Connecticut uh, in the US, in the United States, and I was waiting to meet, uh, at the time, my boss. And uh, he showed up about 45 minutes late, and the, and the reason he showed up 45 minutes late was he'd been in a traffic accident, not a, not a serious accident. He was actually waiting at a junction, car came up behind him, probably a distracted driver, and the driver hit the car from behind. Five to 10 miles an hour, he said. I saw, I saw my boss about six weeks later, and I said, did you, did you get your car sorted? He said, you're not gonna believe it, it was a $45,000 claim. Now, what I didn't realize is that, that, that he was driving a Tesla. And the point is that the, 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 the technology is driving safer driving. There is no question about that. The automatic braking, all the technology that I'm talking about that, that focuses on the driver and fatigue and the telematics that, have, that are really forcing drivers to drive more carefully to, drive, uh, to, to improve uh, their, their premiums. Um, but at the same time, the trouble is it's driving up costs, repair costs in particular. And, and at the moment, the industry is seeing severity, particularly at a point where our inflation is high, as I mentioned previously. So it is driving up severity more than it is frequency. At some point, we believe that will balance itself. And ultimately, over time, this technology can only be, be a good thing for this industry, making driving safer for us all. But at this point, there's no question that the, the threat of the technology is as much a help. The third point is the, is the sharing economies that we spoke about. Um, what, what, what's happened there is some companies have actually created specialized policies. If you think about an Uber driver, an Uber driver can be driving for themselves and therefore they're, 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 a, they're a personal lines risk. 
or they're driving with a passenger in the car, and at that point, there are commercial lines risk. And if you go back five years, it needed separate policies to be able to, um, to, be able to manage that risk. Well, the industry has come a long way, and we now have certain, certain insurers that are now covering the gig economy with usage-based insurance, with policies that are bespoke and designed to that specific product. And, and the industry is definitely moving along with the shared economy and the gig economy. Um, but it takes time. And as I, as, as I said previously, you know, at this point, a lot, of, a, lot of the ins a lot of the industry is still dominated by traditional insurance companies. And some of those insurance companies are yet to catch up with the gig economy. The fourth was uh, electric cars. Um, and these have gained, gained mainstream momentum you know, starting really from 2010, and in the last decade, I don't know how many, I'm sure we could show it, you know, put a show of hands, but just walking through the car park there, I saw three or four Teslas out there, and I'm sure there are many more electric or hybrid cars. And looking at, looking at data, we see in, 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 in developed economies, in terms of new car sales, approximately one in five cars is now an electric, um, uh, an electric car. We only see that increasing because the governments and the regulators are forcing this. The UK government has actually mandated by 20, 2030, which is only seven years away, that no new petrol, diesel, or dirty hybrid cars are to be sold. That's a radical change for an organization. And as I say, that's only seven years away. That's coming. So therefore, there's a market growing quickly where first mover advantage in an understanding around electric vehicles and being able to price and, and, and manage this risk is, is, in, is incredibly uh, opportunistic. But at the same time, we come back to the point about technology driving loss cost, particularly around severity, and it's about managing that. And at this time, just to put some context on it, if you go and buy insurance for an electric car versus a petrol car, the electric car is 60% more expensive to insure. So it's a challenge for the, for, for the industry there. And then finally, autonomous vehicles. I think when I talk about cyber, when I talk about technology, when I talk about the gig economy, when I talk about electric vehicles, the biggest change is autonomous vehicle. I haven't been in one. I have not been in a driverless car. Um, and none of us quite know whether this is taking. But what we don't understand is where does the liability fall? If I'm in a, if I'm in a driverless car and there's a cyber breach or a, or a, or, or a failure of the, of the technology, who's liable? Is it the manufacturer? Is it the data provider? Is it me as the driver? And I don't think we've worked our way around that as an industry. Now, there's very few driverless cars on the road, but given some of the mandates that we're seeing from governments and regulators, it would be wrong to, wrong to think that, that that's not coming. So just in summary, you know, to say where I started, you know, we've seen more change in five years than we have in the previous 50. I think it's fair to say in the next five to 10 years, we're going to see more radical change. And as an industry, it presents tremendous opportunity for us. We're all stakeholders in this, whether you're a regulator, an insurer, a reinsurer, an intermediary, uh, uh, you know, whether you're, you're a contract drafter, whatever you might be, you are going to come up and provide part of the solution of what is perhaps the fastest moving part of our industry in terms of change. So again, thank you so much for allowing me to be here this afternoon. Uh, really good to be back in Casablanca, and I look forward to seeing you through the day. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur James Kent, for your allocution. Thank you so much for sharing with us these insights.